Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is U.S. Army veteran and Korean War veteran Ronald Rosser, who was awarded the Medal of Honor for his valor in Korea. And, sir, it's an honor to be speaking with you today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Columbus, Ohio, and I was raised in southeastern Ohio. The, uh, I'm the oldest son of 17 children. I, when I was turned 17, I left, joined the Army, and the rest of my brothers and sisters, most of them were small, and uh, they uh, they never knew me. They just I was a rumor to them, so I never come back for years. Being the oldest of that many kids, there's probably a lot of responsibilities you had at a pretty young age. I did. I was always getting in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> so you joined the army right after World War II to begin with. Well, actually, uh, about two months before it was over. Okay. Uh huh. And you Because the in. war wasn't over officially until 31 December 46. Ah. The, the fighting had stopped for the most part in uh, in August, but there were still holdouts in both the uh, mountains of Europe and uh, the mountain or the islands in uh, the Pacific. So they never declared it officially over until they took care of those problems. I understand. So how long were you in the first time? Uh, three years. And what did you focus on then? Where were you stationed and what were you doing? I was uh, in the 82nd Airborne. I went in the, went in the 82nd Airborne when I said right, right after I turned 17, finished my basic training and joined the, joined the Airborne. And uh, I was uh, uh, my first three years in the Army, I was Airborne. In fact, uh, I flew a lot, but I never landed once in an airplane. <laughs> Always jumped. Well, that sounds like a pretty good success rate. Uh, why did you decide not to stay in? Uh, they, uh, I just at that time had a had pretty well enough of it and uh, uh, hadn't really thought about it as a career. I just when I went in, I was just interested in going in and joining the paratroops. I uh, I saw a guy make a, a parachute jump from a hot air balloon, a World War One guy. And I thought, boy, that's what I want to do. So the, uh, when I went in the Army, I joined the paratroops. And uh, the, uh, uh, the Army was cu cutting down a lot at that time. And that's one of the reasons I decided to get out. Mm -hmm. And then my kid brother was killed in action in Korea, and I reenlisted immediately. Talk about your reaction to that and then how that immediately led to you wanting to get back in. Well... Like I said, I'm the oldest, oldest son of 17 children, and he was the, the next in line, the one that was killed. And uh, all my life, I'd you know fought for my brothers and sisters. Anybody insulted them anyway, they faced me, and I got pretty good at that stuff. And when my kid brother was killed in action, to me it was just some stranger killing my brother, not an enemy, and. Uh, I made up a mind I was going to kill a lot of people, which I did. And so you re-enlist, and where did you go from there? Well, I, I had to go to a, a refresher course of one week, and actually all I did was crawl underneath a barbed wire with a machine gun shooting over me, <laughs> <laughs> infiltration course. And uh, from there I went to, got on a ship and went to, and uh, stopped in Japan. They took me off the boat in Japan and put me in the, uh, the occupation of Japan. And I stayed there uh, uh, about a month and a half before I finally got a chance to go to Korea. And uh, when I got to Korea, they, uh, uh, they uh, sent me to uh, support company, which is heavy mortars. Right off the bat, I became a forward observer because I'd been trained since almost the day I went in the Army to start with, to be a forward observer. So when I got there, they that's what they made me. Explain what a forward observer does. I call in mortar and artillery fire on the enemy uh, when they expose themselves. And even if they don't expose themselves, I dust them off. I actually killed one awful mess of people, uh, more than you'd believe. I, I killed about 10,000 Chinese and North Koreans 
with mortar fire and artillery fire because there was a lot of targets, the best way to put it. Plus with uh, a rifle fire and hand grenades, I killed another 400. Plus I'm the top soldier in hand-to-hand combat in America. I've killed 20 people in hand-to-hand combat. I had a bad sense of humor, the best way to put it. Uh, I could have shot several people, but I beat them to death with my rifle. Instead, I uh, I kind of like to rattle in their cage. They, uh, I just got I just got good at that stuff. Mm-hmm. When did you first go to Korea? Have the Chinese already come south at this point? Oh yes. Okay. Uh, in uh, I got there the, the middle of July of uh, 19, 1951, and uh, as a Fort Observer, I was involved in some kind of bad situations. The uh, the first three months I was there, uh, about 2,000 men were killed and wounded around me. Almost everybody was around me was killed and wounded, but I, I got more of the enemy than they got of us, a lot more. You had to push to get in to get over yes, to Korea and into combat. Yes, right? sir. In fact, when I uh, when I got to my unit, uh, the company com- my company commander said said uh, Russell, you're an experienced uh, uh, mortar man. I'm going to put you down in the third platoon as a first gunner. I said I'm not going down the third platoon, Captain. I'm going online. And he said, I want to tell you, Russell. He said, I ran the company, and I tell people where they're going and when they're going. He said, you're going down to 3rd platoon as a first gunner. I said, Captain, I'm not going to 3rd platoon or any other platoon. I'm going online. He said, no, you're not. And I stuck my nose in his eye, and I said, I can't think of a way you can stop me. And he said, the only people we have online are Ford observers and radio operators. And I said, sir, I'm the best Ford observer you're ever going to run into. And uh, so uh, after a couple of arguments there, he uh, Put me up as a Ford Observer, radio man, then Ford Observer. I was actually wounded four times. I got wounded on a up on the uh, Bloody Ridge, then I got hit on the Heartbreak Ridge, and then I got hit twice the day of the action of the medal, the uh, through the hand and through the arm, or through the shoulder. I never even went to a doctor or a hospital. I took care of it myself. We'll talk about the action that earned you the medal in, in just a moment. What was uh, your first experience in combat like uh, after all that training? Mm. The first three years you were in, uh, you hadn't been in combat, and now you're in there for the first time. How did it compare to what you expected? It was, it was exactly what I expected. Uh, a great risk to yourself, of course, but uh, I'm one of them kind of people that like living on the edge, so it didn't bother me. I was very good at what they what they put me to doing. People would say, "Aren't you afraid of dying, Ron?" I said, "I'm not even afraid of living." <laughs> the guys was kind of a comedian, you know. I do things there just to irritate the enemy. So, did it take much getting used to in terms of figuring out exactly where to call in? I could more about three different days. I've killed in, killed more than a thousand people. I was good at it. I was trained right from the, almost the day I went in the Army originally to be that. And I, that's the way I ended up. Do you have to develop much of a relationship with the people firing the artillery and the mortars? Or is no. it just a matter of here's the order, here's the coordinates? Yeah, fire. that's it. I say fire mission, I'd coordinate so and so and whatever else I needed. And uh, I almost knew uh, nobody. The uh, I didn't make friends easy. Uh, the only person I was had with me was a radio man, and I lost eight of them, three killed and and five wounded, and then I had to send four back because they couldn't cut it. They uh, just panicked too much, afraid of dying, and and that, that was a thing that I, could happen any day. You talked, obviously, about the, the enemy lives that you successfully took out. You ever think about the American lives you saved? Yes, I uh, A lot of these guys I run into later, and it uh, uh, be quite a reunion, I can promise you. <laughs> they, uh, they had hugged me, and their wives had hugged me, and their, ki- their kids had hugged me, and my uh, get me nervous as heck. You know, they, uh, 
made me feel bad, too. Mr. Rosser, let's go to January of 1952 now and set the stage for us. Where was your unit? What was the objective that day? My unit was Love Company of the 38th Infantry. Our objective that day was a battalion defended uh, mountain about a mile out in front of us. Uh, we, we had a reinforced rifle company of 170 men. By the time we got to the hill, the artillery fort observer had been wounded and lost his sergeant and his radio. By the time we were within somewhere about 40, 45 yards from the top of the mountain, we had went from 170 down to about 35, still on their feet. The weather was very cold, and the enemy was close. <laughs> and uh, things just got pretty nasty. I got on my radio, which was the only one left, and I called the regimental commander, gave him a situation report. I was a corporal, and he wouldn't talk to me, wouldn't know if there was any officers alive, and I said, yes, sir, we have two officers alive, and they were both badly wounded. And uh, he said, is the company commander alive? I said, yes, sir. His whole face was cut in two, and uh, he's not very realistic to talk to, is the best way to say it. And I drug my radio up to him and told him the colonel wanted to talk to him. So the colonel said, uh, I want you to reorganize your men and make one final attempt to take the hill. And the uh, captain said, yes, sir. And uh, he looked up the mountain and get this hopeless look on his face. I heard somebody say, I'll take him up for you, captain. And I realized it was me talking. And I tried to put my hand over my mouth to shut up, you know, because I knew it. I could look up, and I could see about a 200-man burp gun line, submachine gun line, and five heavy machine guns. And all at the same time, we're getting mortar and artillery in on top of us. And I knew it was going to be nasty. The Captain Davis said, Ron, how, how are you going to do that? And I said, well, the only way I know, sir, is move fast and go in shooting. And I said, if we make the trench, maybe we've got a chance. And he said, you know you're not going to make it, don't you? And I said, well, we'll try, sir. So I got all the men that were left and told them, you know, what, what our objective was. And I said, you don't have to worry about which way to go. Just follow me, boys. We're going in shooting. And I said, okay. So I, I gave the word and jumped up. And I said, let's go. And I didn't even look back. I could hear the men behind me in this crunchy snow, about a foot of crunchy snow. It was 25 below zero, too. I got about three feet from the Chinese, and I stopped and looked back, and I was by myself. All the other men that went with me were killed or wounded. And I thought, well, I went to a lot of trouble to get here. No use wasting a whole day. And I let out a scream and jumped in the trench with them. I was so close, I was actually sticking my carbine in their ear. And uh, I shoot one or two, then beat some to death, and shoot another one or two, beat some more. Uh, I was having a good, good go at it, and I just cleaned out a whole trench. Then I got to the end of the trench and knocked out this machine gun bunker with a hand grenade, and then went around the corner of the trench, and here comes about 35 Chinese charging down right at me, and I'm by myself. And so I charged them, you know. It works both ways, you know. And and they broke first, boy, I, and I just stopped and started shooting them in the back of the head as they run from me. They went around the corner of their trench, and I cut across in front of them, and they were running by me, and I was stacking them up in the trench as they run by me. I finally ran out of ammunition, and uh, I went back to where I started uh, after I got to the top of the hill, and uh, some kid broke through to me, and he, he was wounded badly, uh, almost immediately, and uh, I threw him on my shoulder and started walking down the hill, and uh, the Chinese run down behind me trying to bayonet me and shoot me. I just ignored him because I don't, didn't have no ammunition, and, and got this kid on my shoulder, and I can't, I'm not going to lay him down. The wounded men down in front of me started knocking them down around me, and uh, I thought it was funny. I got to laughing. I walked down about 35 yards, and uh, I was laughing. And uh, this lieutenant who was shot in the chest, he stepped out there and he said, Soldier, uh, do you know what you're doing? I said, Yes, sir, I'm killing these varmints as fast as I can. 
but I'm out of ammunition. I got to get me some ammo. And he looked at me real funny and he said, I want to shake your hand. And I thought, well, that's kind of silly. So we're standing out in the open and the, the Chinese are shooting at both of us with, the, you know, with machine guns and everything else. And I thought, I'm going to get killed shaking hands with his ignorant lieutenant. <laughs> but uh, I passed him by and went on, took a wounded man down and laid him down where he was reasonably safe, loaded up on ammunition again, and back up the mountain I went again by myself. And I blasted him away through their line and got in behind him. And, and I took on about 200 Chinese this time. And uh, they were jumping on my back and tackled me and beat me with rifles and, and not about another dozen piled on me. And uh, it was getting kind of hectic there, you know, r running out of space is the best way to say it. <laughs> Sir, you've taken out a trench of Chinese by a variety of means. You've taken out uh, a gun that could have picked you off. You made it back down the hill and you just survived shaking hands with another office, with an officer <laughs> while <laughs> the Chinese were shooting at you. So take, pick up the story from there. Well, I loaded up again. And this time I had, I really loaded up with hand grenades, as many as I could hang on me. And uh, I, I slung my rifle on my shoulder uh, and uh, pulled a pin on two hand grenades and was holding the spoons down and went dog trotting up the hill toward the Chinese. And they couldn't believe one guy was coming at them again. And uh, they hesitated. And as I got close, they, a couple of them raised up to shoot me and instead of waiting, I threw my first kick my spoon and threw my first hand grenade. Instead of shooting me, they was watching where the hand grenade went, and they went right in the trench with them. And I knocked and blasted a big hole in, in their tr line there. And as I went over the trench, I flipped the grenade, other grenade, in on some other Chinese and was trying to get at me. And uh, they uh, got in behind the Chinese this time, started knocking out their bunkers. And uh, a strange thing happened. Uh, when I was up there the first time, I carried this kid back, and uh, he was laying, he was actually laying right in front of a machine gun, I picked him up and, and carried him back, and I went like that to the machine gunner, Chinese machine gunner, and pointed to this wounded kid, and he didn't fire. And uh, so that's the kid I picked up and took to safety. And I got back up there, and I started knocking out bunkers uh, with hand grenades, and I started to throw a hand grenade in this one bunker, and this machine gunner turned around and looked at me, and it was the guy that, that let me pass and didn't fire on me. And uh, I started to throw the hand grenade in, and I thought, nah, he gave me and this kid a chance at life, and I passed him by. I'd never done that in my whole life, and uh, let him live. And I went on down and knocked out the rest, rest of the machine guns and stuff, and the... Uh, that, as far as I know, that Chinese soldier never fired another shot that day. And I ran out of ammunition again and went down and got some more grenades and stuff and went back up again and was throwing hand grenades all over the place. And uh, I had the Chinese on a run, a bunch of them. They were running like heck away from me. And uh, finally ran out of ammunition. And uh, I, I went down and I got in a shell hole there and I, I got five wounded men and in there with me and with some ammunition. And uh, I, t I told one of the kids, I said, you get all the walking wounded you got or we can find and get these dead and wounded off the mountain. And I said, we'll cover for you. And the Chinese would s try to storm down and, and uh, knock us out and knock out the wounded. And uh, we, uh, we had bust them real good and they, they never did quite get to that opportunity. And finally, that one of the kids come up and said, Ron, we got everybody we can find. And I said, okay. And I turned to them boys. I said, let's get out of here. Get the heck out of here. And we got out of the hole and started walking down the mountain. And the Chinese never fired another shot at us. And some general asked me, said, said, Sergeant Rosser, why do you think they didn't fire on you? I said, frankly, I think they was glad to see us go. <laughs> <laughs> the... Uh, and uh, that pretty much ended the, the thing that day, but we lost every man. Every man was killed, wounded, or missing. The um, 170 men, and um, in fact, I was wounded twice that day. Got hit in the hand and through the shoulder. That was the fourth time I'd been wounded. That's a lot of Purple Hearts. No. No, you didn't uh, accept See, them. they had a program going. If you got wounded twice, 
they'd take you off the line. Oh, so you so, didn't report it. So I got hit in the foot the first time, and all it did was hurt a little bit, and I just patched it up and went on about my business. And uh, I got hit the second time, and I knew that I was probably going to get hit again, and so I didn't turn that in either. My company knew I was wounded both times, but uh, they didn't press the thing because I didn't press it. And then the day I got the, the action of the Medal of Honor, I got wounded twice that day, but only one Purple Heart. So it was the same day. And uh, so they made me take the Purple Heart this time. And uh, so I was careful not to get hit again because they'd take you off the line. And uh, I didn't want that. The... Uh, I liked it up there. I get even for a lot of a lot of bad things, and I was really good at that stuff. I mean, really good. The uh, it's hard to say, you know, that somebody's good in you know killing other people, but uh, I really was good at it. So, how long did you stay in theater after that? Several months in combat, and uh, my regimental commander offered, you know, when I got put in for the Medal of Honor ordered me off the line, but I wouldn't come off. And he he kept telling me, you got to come off. And I said, Colonel, you need to go see the, see the medics. He said, what do you mean? I said, you're getting hard hearing. And uh, <laughs> so he, he didn't know what to say, so he said, I'll get back with you. And then a, a few days later, my paperwork hit 8th Army, where I was recommended. And uh, some general called Colonel Rowney up and wanted to, wanted to know where he had put me to keep me alive. And... Uh, Colonel Ronnie said, sir, he's still on the line. He won't come off. And the general got mad. He said, you go get Rosser off right now, right today, and you tell him that he's coming off, and it's an order from a general officer. And Colonel Ronnie called me up and told me that, and I said, sir, would you tell the general this? And he said, what's that? And I said, one, I'm not coming off the line, and two, if he bothers him anymore, he can take that medal and stick it where the sun don't shine. <laughs> And the general, general wanted to know if I, if I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you find out that you had been chosen for the Medal of Honor? I, I, well, I knew then. Okay. I knew then, but uh, like everything else, you know, it, you never know if you're going to get it. You know, you're in for it. When I got, when I got back to the day, I got back to the states. They had me report to some folks there. And they, and they asked me, said, uh, "Were you ever awarded the Medal of Honor?" And I said, "No, sir." And I said, well, we don't know what you've done, but you've been awarded it now. You're going to Washington here in a few days. And that's what I did. My whole family ended up going to Washington, too. Describe, whole whole Greyhound busload. Describe the day for us when you were at the White House with President Truman. Well, I went there with my whole family, and uh, President Truman shook hands with everybody but one of my, his dad, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, his dad hid behind my da my father, and uh, he, my youngest brother, of course. Mm. And he was scared. He he, he wouldn't didn't want to shake that president's hand, and never did. The, but I thought it was kind of funny. And uh, finally, the president took me and the family outside in front of a big audience, and he presented me and another boy the Medal of Honor. A reporter from WHIZ. I uh, was recording the whole thing, and he said that uh, here was a soldier that came to the, the White House to get his, get his medal from the president. He said he looked like a scared schoolboy in the office of the principal. <laughs> but I don't think that was true. Did you At least a, I didn't feel that way. Did you have a private conversation with the president? And yes, sir. What did he say? Yes, sir. Well, we just talked about things. But I've had a private conversation with every president of the United States uh, to back to include Harry Truman. In fact, I just finished having a nice conversation with Mr. Trump. We were at the Oval Office, and uh, the president said, Mr. Rosser said, how's it feel to be in the Oval Office with the President of the United States? I said, sir, I've been in this office under every president since Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> he said, you're kidding. <laughs> it was kind of funny. You know your way around the place. That's good. Yes, sir. I've been there many times. Plus, I've been to every inauguration, inaugural ball since Harry Truman. I was with Obama five different times, twice at the White House, three times on the road with him. George Bush a whole bunch of times. 
and his father, and oh my goodness. I was with uh, President Kennedy the day before he was killed. He had promised to take me right on his yacht. President Kennedy, when he landed at Palm Beach International Airport, I met him there. I was going to check, see if he's going to be there long enough to take me a ride. But he told me there, he said he'd stopped in to see his mother, and he was on his way to Dallas. So he got there the next day and, and was killed. It's a strange thing to be around something like that. We just have a few minutes left in our conversation, Mr. Mm-hmm. Rosser. So obviously it's been more than 60 years now since the armistice. 60, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. The armistice of the, of the Korean War. Um, there's, there's two different ways to look at this. Number one, the efforts of you and everyone else who fought on the side of the South can see a huge difference between the North mm-hmm. and the South. And at mm-hmm. the same time, there's still a threat from the North. So when you see all that, what do you think? I think somebody ought to shoot that turkey that's running the country down, North Korea. I dusted off an awful lot of people up there. I, I never fought in South Korea. I always fought in North Korea against both North Koreans and Chinese. It was kind of interesting to be able to do all that stuff. I n- it never bothered me once. Never bothered me. The, uh, my job was to say, protect the lives of about 800 young soldiers in a, in a, uh, a battalion. And uh, I was very conscientious about taking care of them. The, the, like a couple times, at one time we got hit with about 25,000 Chinese and 800 students or kids waiting there for them to come and they know they can't stop them. And guys like me have to slow them down or thin them out or the, them kids are all dead. And once they break through, they they just murder them all. I'd bust them up a lot, and I actually enjoyed it, you know, knowing that they couldn't get to tear them kids up. I was always out in front of the the whole line, the whole American line, you know, where I could see them coming from every direction, and where I could adjust my fire. Many a time I killed a lot over a thousand people, and wounded, wounded, and God, I have no idea how many more. uh, But they were laying all over the place. What does it mean to you when you see the difference between North Korea and South Korea? North Korea is sparse and autocratic and just a mm-hmm. miserable life for most of their people. And South Korea is thriving as one of the mm-hmm. great economic powers in the world. I've been to Panmunjom with both North Koreans and South Koreans there. And uh, the South Koreans are big husky guys standing like this, you know. And uh, North Koreans are scared of it because <laughs> they're little skinny guys. They don't eat good. And, uh, in fact, about a half starved, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, him North Koreans don't want no part of South Korea, I can tell you that. I've watched them. I've been there many times. In fact, my second tour, I was on, the, I was up on the DMZ. A piece of cake. Really, he, I never once worried about them varmints. It doesn't, doesn't seem right, but uh, that's the way I was, you know. I was trained for this stuff. And uh, if you listen to us today, uh, me and Pat Brady and General Brady and and Mr. Morris, uh, training makes makes a difference. Really, it does. The uh, you have confidence in what you do. The uh, even even uh, Sergeant Morris said he wasn't afraid. The, uh, he didn't have time, and mostly I didn't have time either to be afraid. If things get real hot, I'd get laughing, and I think the Chinese thought I knew something they didn't know. The, uh, but uh, I wasn't afraid. I never was afraid of them people. Besides, uh, I could easily take, take several of them at the same time. And like I said, I told you, I, I've engaged the, the first time up there about 75 Chinese in close combat, I beat, I beat five of them to death with my rifle. Just going to kind of got a mean streak. Instead of shooting them, I just beat them to death. But I was trained for that kind of stuff. Mr. Rosser, unfortunately our time is up. But thank you, sir, for your incredible service to our country. Thank you for your time in this interview. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, it. sir. Honored well, to do it for you. Thank you, sir. Ronald Rosser is a recipient of the Medal of Honor. He's a U.S. Army veteran and, of course, a Korean War veteran. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles.